simply in the presence of the, of the Almighty God. said, let us make man 
in our image. Now that word there, make, uh, the, 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 the word in the original text was the word esa, which means to make from already existing materials. When, when something is made, you take things and you, you reproduce them or you, you form them in a different way to where you're making it into something else or you're combining materials and you're making them into something else. After our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth, creepeth upon the earth. Now, I want to kind of go back a little bit because, it, you know, one of, one of the questions I had as a believer was who was God talking to? When he said, let us make man. Was he speaking to a, uh, a, a trinity? Was he speaking to other members of the Godhead? Was he speaking to angels? Um, was, who was he speaking to? And I sought God many, many years for that answer. I sought it through people. And nobody could give me an answer that, uh, uh, that I, I was comfortable with. Uh, there was always a lot of gray area. So I just continued to search it. And I mean, I searched this diligently and I sought the Lord for this diligently for, for, for many years. And, and as I studied what was actually written there and what was actually said there, um, the, the clarity in, in what was said there actually happens not in verse 26, but in verse 27. You see, it says, let us make man uh, in our image. Now, you have to understand that the, the dialect that this was written in is very different. First of all, uh, there were no pronouns. So there, there was no, in the Old Testament, when it was written in the original text, there was no he, there was no uh, me, there was no us. None, none of that was, was, uh, was written in the Bible. So... Uh, when it says, let us make man in our likeness and our image. Now, you also have to understand that the word Elohim, the word that was used, uh, just like other nouns in the, in the, that were used in the Old Testament, they had both singular and plural meanings. So a lot of times you had to read the actual text to get to the answer as to whether the word or the usage was singular or plural. Now, when you go to verse 27, it clears it up. It, it says, so God created man in his own image. It doesn't say he created, created man in, in our image or in the image of us or in any of that. It says, so God created man in, in, in his own image. It was singular. Now, so it was, he was not saying to to you know, to the angels or anyone else, let us, uh, or like he needed someone else to help him make man. He did not need that. He, he is self-sufficient. He made, created man in his image. He did, that's what he did, which is spirit. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, we are created in the image of the living God. We are created as spirit beings. Man is a spirit. We have a triune existence. We are spirit, body, soul. Let's go to, to, uh, to Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed man. Now, I want to kind of back up a little bit. When it says in, in verse 27, when I talked about create, the word create was the Hebrew word bara, which means to make from non-existing Materials. Now, first it talked about talked about making man, but then it went on to, to clarify it, and it said God created man. God simply just just spoke the spirit of man into existence. Okay, he cre he created man from non-existing materials, and then in verse seven of chapter two it says, and the Lord God formed man, which is the the the, the word yetzar, which means that he literally molded or formed. It's the same word that was used in Jeremiah where it talked about the potter uh, working a work upon the wheels and it said that he molded and formed them. That was Yetzar. It was the same word. So, and the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground 
and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Spirit, <clears throat> body, and soul. Spirit, body, soul. He created man in his likeness and image, which was spirit. And then he formed man from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed into man's uh, nostrils the breath of life, which is the nefesh. He breathed that, breathed that into man's life and into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. Say, I am a spirit, I, I live in a body, I and I have a soul. I cannot have kingdom success, living in the natural. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I will walk in the spirit, and I will not fulfill the lust of my sinful nature. I will present my body a living sacrifice to the Lord, Lord, I, I will not be conformed to this world. I, I am world. being transfigured by the renewing of my mind into the likeness of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Come on, if that's your confession today, put your hands together. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. 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 Let's go to 1 Samuel 17 and 32. 1 Samuel 17 and 32. I do want to say about, uh, about spirit, uh, body, and soul. I do want to say that you cannot accomplish in the natural what God has intended for you to accomplish in the spirit realm. You cannot accomplish in the natural what God intended for you to accomplish in the natural realm. I'm sorry, in the natural realm, what God has intended for you to accomplish in the spirit realm. You cannot win a spiritual battle fighting in the natural. You know, a lot of times our emotions tell us to do this or that, you know, when we're in the, the heat of a battle. You know, that person that, that uh, may push us the wrong way, you know, sometimes in the natural, you know, our thought would be to knock them out or to say something ugly to them or to do something like that. But but you have to understand that it is not the person that is coming against you. It is a, it is a spiritual situation that is being manifested in a natural way. See, your your your, your battle is not with that person. The, it goes deeper than that. It is a spiritual battle. We'll get more into that in just a moment. But I do want to read this. Uh, I, I want to want to tell the background here. Um, this is this is a time when the, the battles, when the, the the armies of Israel were gathered to do battle with the Philistines, and they had many many battles with the Philistines, leading all the way back to Joshua. Joshua, uh, before he died, he mentioned that uh, the Philistines still needed to be defeated. In other words. Uh, they had defeated their foes, they had conquered other nations, but the Philistines had not been defeated. They were, they were still their enemies. <clears throat> now, Saul actually fought the Philistines seven times. He fought them seven times. Now, the sixth time uh, that, that fought, Saul uh, fought them, this is actually the sixth time. Uh, six is the number of men. Now, the seventh, seventh time is, is seven is God's perfect number. So the seventh time, he and his sons were killed. Now, God told Saul to destroy the Philistines. Um, he should have done it. He should have never fought them seven times. The seventh time he fought them, uh, he didn't make it through that battle. But at that time, he was under a lot of judgment uh, for consulting with a witch and some of the other things that, that he did. I think it's in uh, 1 Samuel verse 15, uh, chapter 15, it talks about how God had literally taken his presence off Samuel, uh, off Saul, I'm sorry, right, right. off Saul, and uh, Samuel came to him and told him that, and uh, he, he, he told, he actually, in, in chapter 15, he actually anointed David as king, so God had moved away from Saul, and he had moved on to a new king. Now, I want to say this. Uh, Saul typifies, he, he's a type of the flesh. That's what he is. He was a carnal man. 
he was carnal and, and the presence of God had left him. David is a type of the spirit man. He is a type of the spirit. He was a worshiper. He was spiritual. He, 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 he flowed in, in spiritual anointings. He was a prophet. He was a king. And he was a priest. Um, and, and we got a little noise here. I want to give this to you to, to, you, to see if that is my car. That is going off like that. But he he actually um, was a, David was a type of the spirit. We got that? Okay, so Saul represented the flesh or the carnal man. He lost his walk with God. Um, and and during his, his, his reign as the king, are we unable to figure that out? During his reign as, as, um, as king, many things transpired with uh, with him and with his kingship, and God had moved on beyond him, and and He had anointed David to be the incoming or the next king. Is that okay? Is that clear? Everybody understand that? I know we were a little distracted there for a moment, and and so the, our our uh, text says, uh, starting with verse thirty two. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, at this time, for 40 days, uh, this 9 foot 9 inch uh, Philistine named Goliath uh, had literally tormented, challenged, and, and verbally abused Israel and their God. Nobody would fight it. Now, I personally have always felt like this was a battle that was for Saul. That's what I felt like. Uh, this was a battle that Saul was supposed to fight. Uh, but Saul, because of the state that it was in, he was a man that was now walking in fear and walking in doubt. And the scriptures tell us that an evil spirit from God had come upon Saul. And that he called for David as an anointed minstrel. To, to, to worship and to play and to sing. And, and the Bible says that when David would play, the evil spirit that was on Saul would go away. So here we are. This, this Philistine had been tormenting God's people. And David wanted no part of it. He, he, he wasn't going to stand by and let this happen. He said that this uncircumcised Philistine has no right to torment the people of the living God. So here we see David telling Saul that he's going to fight it because nobody else would fight it. Nobody else in Israel would stand up. Goliath was asking for a warrior or a man of war to come forth and to do battle with him. He had stated that if someone comes forth and if they defeat me, we will concede this battle to you. But if I defeat them, you will have to concede uh, your, your, your battle to, to the Philistines. So David said, I'll go. I'll handle this. So this is where we are. We're at that point now. And David said unto Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistines. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, mm -hmm. and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Mm -hmm. He's telling his resume. Mm -hmm. This is my resume. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm qualified to do this. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the, defied the armies of the living God. Right. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and, and the Lord be with you. And Saul armored David. Now that is, is 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 something that we're going to talk about today. Saul tried to give David his armor. Now 
Understand, Saul was a big, tall man. It's believed that Saul was probably 6'6 or 6'7. He was a very, very handsome man. He was a man that, according to his outward appearance, Israel wanted him as their king. See, he was the man that, that Israel, the Israelites, decided. They're the, they're the ones that picked Saul as their king. God picked David. Now, Paul was, Saul was a, a, a very, you know, handsome man. He was tall. He was, you know, he was well built. And, and so he's trying to put on this, this ruddy young boy, he's trying to put his armor on him and say, this is what you need to put on. We need to put this on you to go to battle. Now, there, prior to this scripture, um, in earlier texts, it talked about how Goliath had a, a coat of mail on and how he had on a brass helmet. Okay? So those are the same things that, that Saul tried to put on David. Mm -hmm. He tried to give Saul, the, he tried to give David the same exact armor and the same exact pieces of the armor that, that Goliath had on. And so we see what David's response is. And Saul armed David with his armor and, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he and, uh, and he assayed to go for he had not proved it. So in other words, David was saying that I can't, I can't, I can't fight with this stuff. This is not stuff that I've proven. I have not I have not tried this for battle. It just, he hadn't even gotten into the battle yet. Amen. But he knew that it just did not feel right. Amen. He was about to go into battle Amen. with something that he was not sure that he was supposed to be putting on. Amen. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. So we're going to talk for a few minutes about the right weapons for my battle. Right. That's what we're going to talk about for a little bit. Right. The right weapons for my battle. Right. Ephesians 6 and 12, Paul says that as believers, our battle and conflicts with our adversaries are not carnal or fleshly in nature. Remember now, we're going to talk a little bit about some of David's writings. And something I want you to remember, when David was talking about the flesh, he, he said things like, um, if, if we walk in the spirit, then we shall not fulfill the lust, our lust of the, the lust of the flesh. Technically, the word that was used there was not flesh; it was sinful nature. Okay, I want you to remember that uh, the flesh is the part of, of of man that 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 is is just the outer shell of us. The flesh is not what gets us in trouble. The soul is is the part of man that houses the emotions. It houses the will. It houses the intellect. It houses the desires. Sin is conceived in the soulish realm. Now I want to tell you about the spirit of man. Now, we talked about it a little bit in Genesis. But the spirit of man is created in God's image. It is the part of man that is created in God's image. It is inherently good. Your spirit cannot do wrong. Your spirit is the part that, that keeps the rest of you in line. We talk about often... Uh, in the in the cartoons, remember how the little angel used to be on one shoulder and the little devil on the other other shoulder? The angel represents the spirit man. That's what it represents. It's the part that says, don't do that. God, our Father, would not like that. That is against God's word. You don't want to do that. That's the spirit man. But then the soulish man is saying, oh, doesn't that look tempting? Oh, doesn't that look good? God won't know it. Nobody will know it. He won't know it if you eat of that fruit. You know, you won't surely die. That's the soulish man, the part of man that 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 rationalizes things, the part of man that is reasoning. The part, the mind is a part of the soul, the soulish realm. Um, the Bible talks about guarding your heart um, because out of it flows the issues of life. Yet yeah, that, that, that is is also a soulish part. Now, what you have to do is you have to edify. And you have to uplift the spirit man to the point that the, the soulish man cannot rise up against the spirit. Thus, if you walk or live in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts and the desires of the soulish man. That's what Paul was talking about. So, so he 
goes on to identify the four primary spirit rebels, rebels that we do, value, uh, do battle with. The first one is principalities. Principalities are the chief rulers of, dark of darkness. Then he goes on and talks about powers. Powers are uh, actually carry out what the principalities put in place. So the powers that he's talking about put, carries out what the, the chief rulers put in place. Now you have to understand this. As we go further into this, you're going to see that the battles that we're fighting, the situations we're dealing with, they are not just coincidence. They are not haphazard. Everything is strategic. Everything that comes against you from the enemy is strategically planned against you. And he has strategic plans to affect your life, and you are not going to haphazardly defeat him. You're not just going to be able to put on that, that helmet of brass and that coat of mail and just go into battle and say, because I'm showing up like Saul, which represents the flesh did, that I am going to be victorious in this battle. You have to understand that every single battle that the believer is fighting is spiritual in nature. Now, it may have natural manifestations. You know, sickness and disease is not of God. So when sickness and disease attacks your body, it is of the enemy. So is there a manifestation? Yes, there is a manifestation. But it is, a, it is not... It, it, the way you're going to defeat that manifestation is by using spiritual methods. And then it goes, he goes on to talk about rulers of darkness of this age. And then he talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. Those are different types of stuff, of demonic spirit beings. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about your battle, the battles that we're fighting. We're fighting against demonic presences in our lives, and they are real. That's what Paul is saying. You cannot defeat an enemy that you don't understand and you don't believe in, most importantly. There are sects of Christians that don't believe in, 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 in demons or in, 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 the, the, in, in darkness in the world. But just like there is light, there is also darkness. But the good news is, he's given us the victory. That's the good news, is that, is that we've already got the victories. So we have to understand that we're, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against just that person that is trying to do something against you. What we're dealing with, we're dealing with a strategic, well-planned, spiritual attack on your life to keep you from seeing God's purpose, God's destiny, and God's plan for your life unfold in your life. A lot of the, the things that you're going through, if you understood your adversary better, you would be fighting those battles in different manners. Mm, that's good, Apostle. You would be fighting them in different ways. Yeah. See, it's not that person on your job that's right, coming God. against you. Come on. It is the enemy, your adversary, that is operating through that person to, to keep you from fulfilling God's plan for your life. Absolutely. You, know, you have to understand that you can knock that person out. <laughs> But all you're going to get is fired from your job and then you're probably going to jail. And then the enemy will be happy. What does God say? God says to turn the other cheek. You see, everybody got quiet. God says to turn the other cheek. He says that we're supposed to love our enemy. See, all that's spiritual. Those are spiritual weapons. That's, that's what God is saying. He's, he's saying you can't, you can't fight that fire with fire You've Come got to on. fight that fire with my word. That's right. You've got to fight it with, the, with his word. See, you've got to understand that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, yes. but they are mighty through yes. God to the yes. pulling down of yes. enemy in in strongholds. Yes. He yes. never intended for you to fight the battles that you're fighting in the natural realm. You have to understand that you are a spirit being. You are created in his image, and he has anointed you and appointed you to be victorious and he has given you everything that you need in the spirit realm to be victorious in any battle that you go into. Yes. I, you know, I talked a, a lot about uh, the spirit, the body, and the soul. We often talk about that. But we just want to make sure that everybody puts this into use. We want to make sure that the reason we start off our messages with our uh, and our services 
with our confession of faith is because if you understand the concepts that we're talking about, being a spirit, living in a body, having a soul, not being able to um, to have kingdom success in the natural, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. When you start understanding those things, you already have started moving towards your victory. If you're, if you're thinking that you've got to take all of this weight and all of these burdens upon your back and upon your shoulders, you're, you're missing it. Because he came and he bore all of our infirmities. He bore all of our sickness, all of our disease. It's all on his shoulder. The Bible says that the government is up on his shoulders. That is the authority to rule rest upon Jesus. We're fighting battles that he never intended for us to fight. Yes. That he never intended. All you have to do is take on your spiritual weapons. And so that's that's what we're going to uh, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit deeper today. We're going to talk a little bit more about our spiritual weapons, but we also want to understand our spiritual foes a little bit. I, I don't usually talk about this type of thing on, on Sunday mornings. I don't usually talk about our spiritual foes. I don't usually talk about um, the enemy. I, do, I, I reserve that for our Bible study and our ministers training and that kind of thing. But in order to understand the weapons that we're going to use, we have to understand the ways and the methods of the enemy that we are fighting. So we have to understand that there are literally uh, demonic forces that have been released to prohibit you. To, the Bible says that, that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Uh -huh. There are many different ways for him to do that. There are literally, biblically, there are 12 strong men that the Bible lists uh, as different demonic rulers that are assigned to affect you in your life and to keep you from achieving your God-given goals and desires. Now, so what you have to understand is there are different manifestations of these strong men and they will combine together to hold you in bondage in different areas of your life. There are, there are assignments against your health. There are assignments against your money. There are assignments against all different aspects and areas of your life. And you're fighting an enemy. The Bible, Bible says that he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may desire. But thank God, through Jesus, we've got the victory. I have to keep saying that. When I'm teaching something like this, I have, have to keep saying that. And, and you know, I, I do want to mention the book that, that, that I, have, I have written and Prayerfully, we'll be able to release it this year, but it's called Conquering Our Spiritual Enemies, and you guys know that we've been teaching from, from that for years uh, to our ministers, uh, but I just want to want to say that, that there are many different things that the enemy will do to keep his, God's people in bondage, and in a lot of cases, God's people don't have any understanding as to the ways and means of their adversary. You cannot defeat an adversary that you don't understand. And like I said a moment ago, and in a lot of cases that you don't believe uh, that he exists. Right. Enough of that. I want to just move on to some great news. Y'all ready for some great news? Yes. The Bible says that if God be for us, Amen. who can be yes. against us? Yes. The Bible says yes. that greater is he that is within me that he that is within the world. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. It goes on to say that no weapon that is formed against God's people shall in any ways prosper. It says that you have been given the ability to tread upon serpents and scorpions. God has made ways for you. He said that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord is going to lift up a standard against that enemy. It goes, you know, that your enemies have literally become the enemies of the living God. So, so you don't have to worry. If your enemies have become his enemies, you don't have to worry about it. God has got it under control. He, he's not going to allow you to fail. That's why he put these things into place. That's why he provided these weapons for your success. 
That's why he made it where you are already victorious through Christ Jesus. So let God arise and let all of his enemies be scattered because you have the victory through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians 15, after drawing many parallels and comparisons between the natural and the spiritual man, Paul concludes by declaring that flesh and blood cannot inherit, be successful, or be victorious in the kingdom of God. If the believer is going to be victorious over the enemy, it won't be by power and it won't be by might. God has given you his spirit to work along with your spirit to ensure that you have the power to be victorious. Now, when you're in filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and your spirit become connected. They become one. They become united to make you successful in, in, in every endeavor, every situation in your life. So Jesus said that I will not leave you comfortless. Mm -hmm. Your comforter, your ability to do the right thing, your ability to overcome has already been provided for you. So all you have to do is let God arise and let his enemies, which even your enemies fall under that because your enemies have become his enemies, let his enemies be scattered. God has already equipped and qualified you to win every battle that you face. He's already equipped you and he's already qualified you to be victorious in every battle that you face. Come on, say this. Say, God has equipped me. God has equipped me. And he has qualified me. And he has qualified for every battle. For every battle. Say, God has equipped me. God has equipped me. And God has qualified me. And God has qualified me. For every battle. For every battle. Listen, that thing you were dealing with at home, when you go home, you're going to take authority over that. It's not going to have any more control, any more place in your home. It's not going to have any more place on your job. The things that you're fighting, today is the day that we set this in order. All you have to do is understand that he has already made you more than a conqueror. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about you overcoming every work, every act of the enemy that comes your way. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, Paul says that, even though our human humanly existence is carnal, our battles and fights are not carnal battles, but they are spiritual battles. Amen. They're not carnal battles, they are spiritual battles. Paul goes on to say that because our battles are not carnal, for us to gain victory and to ensure kingdom success, our weapons, therefore, uh, our weapons must be spiritual in nature, thereby making them mighty, through God and able to pull down the enemy's strongholds in our lives. In other words, because you're not fighting against flesh and blood, you cannot take flesh and blood weapons into the battle. You can't do that. You've got to fight spiritual battles in the spirit realm. That's what you've got to do. Paul states that by the believer using these spiritual weapons which God has made mighty, we will be able to do three things. Cast down vain imaginations. Now what that means is you're able to, in your mind, in your mind, you're able to overcome. Now here's what I want to say. The greatest battlefield for the believer is the battlefield of the mind. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of believers show up for the battle already defeated. Oh. A lot of believers feel like there's no way I can overcome this thing that, I, that I'm that i against. You know, and it's crazy because when we're in church and when we're around other believers, we're quoting scriptures, we're shouting, we're proclaiming the victory, but when we come face to face with our personal adversary, we, we have this mindset where we cannot overcome it by ourselves. So what we do, we get on the phone and we start calling people and telling them what needs to happen or what you're going through, you My need God. to get on the phone and call yes. King Jesus and he already knows what's going on. You're not informing him of anything, but you need to tell him, I cannot do this by myself. I need your help. I know that you have given me everything that I need to be successful and I am going to rely and depend on you in this situation. 
I don't need mama. I don't need daddy. I'm not going to sit around and call up a whole bunch of people. My faith yes. is in you. I know you will not yes. leave me yes. nor yes. forsake me. I know that yes. you will not let me fall because you are the God of my salvation yes. and I put my trust and I put my hope in you. Yes. Now, vain imaginations is, is, is what that is talking about is failing religious systems. It's talking about false teachings and false doctrines. Mm -hmm. it's, it's talking about mythology. It's, it's talking about theories that do not line up with God's word. Why is that important? Why is Paul talking about that? Because the Bible talks about many people taking on in the last days the doctrines of devils. Mm -hmm. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. It is talking about people taking on doctrines that will literally tell you that God cannot do that or God does not move in that way anymore. God is somehow limited in your situation. So that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about taking away, you know, that God will take, literally take away vain or false imaginations from your mind. He goes on to say that you will also have victory over every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Every thought that comes into your mind that, that says, when the Bible says that God will make a way, and if your mind says God's not going to make a way, there is something wrong there. There has to be a reconnection, and it has to be, that whole mindset has to be changed back to the knowledge and the understanding yes. that what God's Word says is the final answer. Right. That's what it is. That's we right. have to understand right. that your mind, you have to take control. Put your hands on your head. Say, my mind would be a terrible thing for me to waste. Come on, say, my mind would be a terrible thing for me to waste. You have to understand that everything that, that goes forth in your thinking and in your thought processes has to line up with the word of God. It has to be consistent. You can't, when you're on a high place, you can't say God is mighty and he is great. And then when you're in a low place, say, oh, God has forsaken me. God is still at that high place where you were talking about. He is still mighty and he is still high and lifted up. All he's got to do is reach down and pull you out of that situation and bring you back up to where you're supposed to be. So your mind has to be stayed on him. You have to keep your focus. You have to understand that no temptation or no situation has come upon you that is not common to man. Somebody has already been delivered from what you're yes. going through. God is going to bring you out. He is not going to let you fail. He has shown you this time after time after time. That's Your right. mind has to line up and you have to understand that no weapon that is formed against you, God is not going to let them prosper. Even though they may be formed, he's not going to let them prosper. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 So the mind and the soul are one. The mind and the soul are one. They are, they're, they're, that's one. The, the mind is a part of the soul. The mind literally, literally has more influence on the soulish man than pretty much any other, any other, uh, any other uh, part of it. Now emotions, your emotions can, can be a big part. But right now Paul is talking about the mind. He's talking about having the mind because as the, as your mind goes so is your soul going to go so is that so is that part of you that houses the will the intellect it's going to follow along the same road y'all stay with me we're going somewhere here paul says in romans 7 for though i delight in the law of god after the spirit man i see another law in my members at war against my mind and against my soul and taking me captive to sin in my flesh, which is in my sinful nature. Remember Paul said that when I would do good, evil is always present with me. See, he had the sense to know that. He had the, he had the mindset that he understood that no matter how good he was doing or how hard he tried to do good, there was still going to be things that he was going to have to overcome by the power of God and That's by the right. weapons that God had given him. So he understood that. And so understanding that, when you understand that you're in a battle, you're in a you're in a fight, it's not always gonna be hunky dory. 
You have to understand that God is not going to let you fail. That's what you have to understand. If His Word is true, and it is, He is not going to let you fail. He is going to make you victorious over every work of the devil. Romans 12 and 2 says, Be ye transfigured. The word there for transfigured is metamorpho, the Greek word, which literally means, the, which, which, which actually in the original text it said transform. But, but metamorpho means transfigured. That's what it is. The word, that word that's used there means to be tra literally transfigured. What that word means is to take on a new appearance. You have to literally take on a new appearance by renewing your mind. Your mind has to be renewed into the mind of Jesus Christ. Let the same mind be in you, the Bible says, that was also in Christ Jesus. To be victorious in God's kingdom, you must first and foremost get and keep the victory over toxic or important stinking thinking. You got to have the you got to have the victory over the thinking that woe is me. Woe is me. There's no way I can overcome this. Now I know we're talking about the weapons of our, our, our warfare. We're talking about the weapons that God has given us. But the mind is the biggest battle. That's why we're spending so much time talking about the mind. Because if you think as a man thinketh, so is he. You know, you've got to understand that, that you've got to think the thoughts that are pertaining to the word of God. You've got to understand that God is not a man that he should lie, nor is he the son of man that he should ever have to have to repent for lying. To be victorious in God's kingdom, you must first and foremost get and keep that victory. Once again, toxic and thinking, stinking thinking. You gotta get rid of it. Then the believer must have an understanding of the wiles, the ways, and the strategies of your enemy, of your adversary. Remember I said you cannot defeat an enemy that you don't understand his ways. You got to understand his ways. His ways, you know what they are? His ways are to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Right. Mm -hmm. That's his ways. That's what the word says. That's what, he, that's what his word says. You know what the rules of the battle are? There are none. There are no rules. He's willing to do anything within his power to, 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 to make you fail. You're right. Anything to, to, to make God's plan for your life not come to be. Like a military strategist, he will use a precise plan specifically designed to attack each believer. He exaggerates the pleasures of sin while minimizing the true nature and outcome that sin brings. Mm -hmm. Jesus told Peter, the enemy destroys to sift you as we. And then he goes on a little bit further. He used a weapon. He said, but I have prayed for you. But I have prayed for you. See, that's your example right there. In other words, Peter, if, if I hadn't prayed for you, if I hadn't used this spiritual weapon, the enemy would have sifted you as we. And I turned it. Listen, you've got the same authority to turn your situations using the spiritual weapons that God has left you in, uh, with to be victorious. He will attack any opening or doorway in our lives, even through our emotions, past, insecurities, and moods. I like to teach that the enemy is, is like a watchman. He's like a, like a night watchman. He'll just, every night, He'll just come and he'll just shake every door. See if it's That's it. He'll just, he'll just watch. He's, he's, he, he, he's methodic. He'll just shake every door. And then when he finds that door that's unlocked, that's when he'll go in. And the enemy says that, and I'm sorry, and, and the Bible says that the enemy, when he gets that opportunity, he'll bring friends with him. And the latter state of the believer is going to be worse than the, than the former state. You've got to close those doorways. Yeah. You've got to keep your guard yeah. against every area of your life. The time to pray is not, is, well, always is the time to pray. But the time to pray for situations and people is not always wait until something happens. But you need to pray when everything looks good. That's right. You yeah. need to pray when That's everything true. is up, You're even right. before that person messes up. Even before you mess up, you need to pray. See, you don't wait until the child goes out and skins up his knee to pray for the child. You pray for the child when the child first says he's going outside to pray, to play. You pray for him then and you bind 
any any harmful acts that may happen to him. He is a master marketer, marketing agent, and will use people, places, and things to distract you or to lead you astray. Have you ever noticed that sometimes God will just move somebody, your best friend? He'll just move your best friend out of your life. You ever notice that? One day everything's hunky dory, the next day they just gone. And then you're around trying to ask them what's happening, this, that, and the other. Just gone. Just gone. God has just moved them out. God is saying, listen, this is the road, this is the path that leads us to destruction. Yes. God will literally just take that situation, take the potential of that situation turning negative out of your life. Listen, sometimes God will tell us that he will show us to separate ourselves from situations, uh, people, places, and things. We have to move on those things. We have to understand that every doorway that we leave open is going to be a potential doorway mm -hmm. for the enemy to attack us. We have to understand his ways and his methods. Um, I want to say, after all of that, thank God for Jesus, which has given us the victory through Christ. Amen. You know, I have to say Amen. that after teaching all those things. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank God yes. for Jesus who has given us the Amen. victory through Jesus Christ. Yes. Come on, say that. Thank God for Jesus, Thank God, Jesus. which has given us the victory, us the victory. In, Jesus in Jesus Christ. Come on, the devil needs to hear you say that. Say, thank God for Jesus, Thank God for Jesus. which has given us the victory, us the victory. Through, Jesus through Jesus Christ. Quickly, let's, let's look, go to Ephesians 6 and 10. We're going we're gonna to end there. But I, 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 you know, all that was just was just a setup for the weapons. That's what it was. I had to identify what kind of battle that we're fighting. I had to identify who your enemy is. Beautiful. I had to identify, identify what your enemy's methods are. That's now I'm going to tell you about the weapons that we use in battle. Is that all right? Yeah, all right. Okay, now we're going to talk about them. And, and Paul says in verse number 10, it's like Paul knew what I was going to be teaching. He said, I am. Ah. <laughs> He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, he didn't say be, be strong in the power of your might. He says, be strong in the power of God's might. I'm going to let that soak in for a minute. Paul encourages us to be strong in God. Does that make sense? Yeah. We got that? And then he says, put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor. He doesn't say, put on part of the armor. He says, you've got to wear the whole armor. You've got to put it on. You've got to put on the whole armor. You can't put on this piece or, or that piece and then say, I'm going to be, I'm going to be victorious. You've got to put on the whole armor of God to be victorious in your battle. Anybody been through some battles? Yes, yes. Anybody enjoying a few things right now? The enemy trying to do some crazy stuff. Uh, this is the stuff right here that's going to make you victorious. Amen. And it's going to keep you victorious. Thank if you put on the whole armor and you keep it on all the time, you. oh, you can't help but walk in victory. Yes. That you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. The wiles means the methods or the strategies or the entrapments of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Remember, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because this is a spiritual uh, kingdom. God's kingdom is spiritual. A carnal person won't get it. A carnal person will not understand turning the other cheek. A carnal person will not bring in, understand bringing 10% of your income into the house of God. A carnal person will not understand spiritual things. So, so what he says is we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. He went over that. Powers against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand. Okay, so this is how you're going to stand. You ready for it? Yeah. This is how you're going to stand. The believer is going to stand. And then it says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. The loins for Israel. Remember, now, most of this, most people think that all this stuff was came out of Paul's mind, and I guess you can say it did. Most of this stuff came out of the Old Testament. Paul just took it and he just he just uh, put it in New Testament form. Having your loins girded about with truth. So 
the, the, when, when Israel, when, when Jewish people talk about the loins, they're talking about this part right here. And specifically, what they're talking about is reproducing. It's talking about the reproductive uh, organs. Remember in, in, uh, in Acts number one, chapter one, it says that, and when the Holy Spirit has come, you will, you will receive power. And remember we talked about the word dunamis, which is the Greek word that is power there. Now, dunamis means dynamite like power that will enable you to reproduce after your own kind. So here Paul is talking about reproducing new Christians. Now understand, this is a spiritual armor. So the, the, the parallels I'm going to draw, they're going to be spiritual parallels. Does that make sense? Yes. So he say, guard the part of you that will allow you to reproduce after your own kind. Well, when it says reproduce after your own kind, it's talking about reproducing new believers. That's what it's talking about. Y'all understand that? Okay, so stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, now, you know, something you have to think about here. It, it, does, it only talks about the breastplate. It does not talk about the back. It does not talk about the part of the armor that covers your back. You know why? Because God's got your back. Right. He, had, he has your back. You don't have to, you don't have to look back you know, for, for those attacks, God's got your back. But the breastplate covers the heart. Yes, sir. Out of the heart flows the issues of life. Yes, sir. Yeah, your heart. See, you got to guard your heart. You've got to guard it because the God, your heart will, will literally, you can, you, can let, you can let anger and, and bitterness come into your heart and it can throw your whole walk off. So we're talking about spiritual weapons here. We're talking about being successful against the ways, the wiles, and the means of the enemy. So you got to put on, you got to gird your loins with truth. What is truth? There's only one truth in the earth, the truth of the gospel. That's it. There's only one truth. That's it. And then you got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to put up, you got to shard your feet. With the, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Beautiful are the feet of they that deliver the word of the gospel. Y'all remember that? Uh -huh. You've got to you got to go. When God tells you to go, your spiritual weapon for your feet is going to be the gospel. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, even a place that, that, that may appear to be a bad place, you've got to take the gospel with you. You can't stray away from the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ has to be every place that the soles of your feet touch. You've got to take the gospel. God said in Joshua, he said, meditate on my word day and night. Meditate on it day and night. And then he said, every place that the soles of your feet shall touch, I have given to you. Why? Because you're meditating and you've got the word at the forefront. Everywhere you go, the word of God is guiding you. Everywhere you go, your actions are controlled by the word of God. And then it goes on to say, above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, your faith, your faith is one of your most important spiritual weapons. You can't walk in faith some days. You can't sometimes have faith and sometimes be walking in fear and doubt. Actually, what the, what the shield of faith is supposed to do is supposed to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one so when that fear and when that doubt, when that anger, when all of those things start to come your way, you put up that shield of faith and that shield of faith will block all of those things off of you. Right. Every attack that he comes with, be it wrath or, or be it lust, that shield of faith will literally allow you to block those darts that are going to come your way. See, I told you all recently, the, the thing about the shield of faith that you need to know it's, it is not just a defensive weapon where you hold it up and you try to keep the enemy off of you. The shield of faith is actually an offensive weapon too. You are literally supposed to take your faith and you're supposed to guide the enemy and push him where you want him to go. You don't hold the 
shield of faith up and then let him guide you and push you where he wants you to go. You've got to be the aggressor. You've got to be the one that's on the offensive. You've got to understand that that shield, which is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to be one of your most valuable and one of your most priceless weapons that you've got in the kingdom. Yes. Your faith, you've got to believe. If all else fails, your faith cannot fail. You have got to believe and you've got to know in your knower that God is in charge of every situation that happens to you and that he is not going to let you fail. He is not going to let you fail. So you gotta, you got to carry that shield of faith with you. And then it says, take the helmet of salvation. Remember that Saul tried to give David a, a helmet that was made out of brass? Now, brass typifies uh, humanity. It is a type of man. It is a, it, Actually, can I tell you what it represents? It represents the curse. That's what it represents. Remember all of the vessels in the outer court of the temple. Remember the, 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 the altar and the, and the brazen labor. They were made out of brass. Why? Because they typify mankind. And they typify the curse that Adam, because of Adam's sin. So David said, I can't put that helmet on. Remember that coat of mail that, that Saul tried to put on him? You know what a coat of mail is? It's, have you ever seen those metal uh, things that they put on? That 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 uh, that they wear that will stop you know minor cuts and and that kind of thing and he did not put it on instead you know our our encouragement today is it putting on the breastplate of righteousness that's 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 what we should be wearing but here the helmet of salvation now the helmet of salvation covers what you got it your mind it covers your mind remember all the things we've been talking about with your mind mm -hmm. so you God is literally giving you. A, a helmet which is your salvation yes. that will protect your mind. Why does it protect your mind? Because you can rest at peace in what he says about your salvation Amen. is going to come to pass. Yes. Everything that he said, every promise that he gave you about his himself, your salvation, is, is not is not is, is not a chance that it's going to fail. You are going to be successful. Why? Because he that said it cannot fail. Amen. Yeah. Now, you know, I used to, I used to, when I first got saved, my doubt was never in God. My doubt, my concern, my fear, it was never in God. Right, my doubt, my concern, and my fear was always that I was going to do something stupid and mess, mess it up. Mm -hmm. That was always my concern. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I never lacked faith for him or in him. I, I lack faith in myself because mm -hmm. I had messed so many things up mm -hmm. in my life. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can rest assured that he's got you. He's got you. He's got you. You got to understand that these weapons are the weapons that are going to make you successful in his kingdom. Your victory has already been ensured. Can I tell you the truth? You are already victorious. That's why Jesus died. See, if the enemy feels like if he can keep you from knowing who you are, uh -huh. and if he can keep you from understanding who your Savior is, that he can keep you in bondage. Y'all yeah. understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If you don't know who you are, if you could just see how God sees you, mm -hmm. if you understood who he sees you as and who he created you as, you would understand that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You would understand that you are the head and not the tail. Great message. You would understand that you're blessed going yes. in and that you're blessed going out. Yes. You would understand that even as you're just walking, doing what God said for you to do, all these blessings are coming upon you and they're overtaking you as you're obedient to his word. You would understand that every place that the soles of your feet tread, yes. he has already given to you. Thank you. You know, some battles we don't even have to fight. Some battles, all we have to do is just show up. Some battles, you are already victorious just because of who you are. Just because of whose you are. You're already victorious. And then it says, and then it says, it says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Woo, that's a good weapon. 
Yes. That is a an awesome yes. weapon. Now let me tell you about the sword. There were two different types of sword that Israel used. They used the, the, the double-edged sword and the single-edged sword. Now the single-edged sword was just, a, it was a razor-sharp sword that was easy to use. And, and the main thing about that sword was that it lacerated and it cut. Got that? It lacerated and it cut. But in Paul, Paul's teaching, he talks about the double-edged sword, which has two, two uh, edge on each side. Uh, it's pretty sharp, but it's very heavy. And it is used as an offensive and defensive weapon also. So you can literally take it and you can defeat your enemy by hacking them or stabbing them. Or you can hold it up and you can protect yourself. But here's the part that I like. The word of God says that, that the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to cut asunder, dividing spirit and soul. So the spirit, which is the part of man that is created in God's likeness and image, it is able to cut away the soulish man, which tries to inhabit your mind and your heart, and it makes it to where your spirit man is in full effect, and it makes the soulish man of no effect because it can divide them asunder. And it cuts to bone and marrow. It cuts all the way. It divides them in two. You see, you are able to walk in the spirit. Don't think that it's hard. Don't think that it's difficult. All you got to do is apply the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You apply the word to the situation, and you're going to see the soulish man just being cut apart. He's just going to start diminishing. You're going to see yourself walking around looking like a little Jesus. You're going to be in his image. You're going to be in his likeness. You're going to start feeling that, that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You're going to start believing that you're more than a conqueror because of, of he who, who loves you and died for you. You're going to start believing the word of God in its full extent for your life. Amen. If you cut away with the word of God and you divide the spirit realm and the soulish realm. Now, most people teach that here Paul talks about five weapons. We covered five, right? But if you say there's only five, you miss the most important one. Well, not the most important one. I'm going to say one of the most important ones. Give me a little volume, Melvin. Verse number 18. Prayer. A, pray. Always with all prayer and supplication. Prayer is one of your chief weapons. Yes, it is. Prayer is one of your chief weapons. Remember what Jesus told Peter? But I pray for you. The enemy wanted to sift you as we, but I prayed for you. I prayed for you. I prayed for you and I turned it. See, prayer is one of your chief weapons. Fasting, you combine that with fasting, you really got something. You really got something. But but these things, if you use these things, if you use these weapons, you will overcome every fight that, that the enemy may bring your way. Every what every fight. That he brings your way. And just, just to touch, you can just sing, sing something soft. I just want to I want to end kind of going back to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, um, we saw a lot of different things happening. And there was a there was a lot going on in that situation. But you have to understand, what I want you to understand was that David was a type of the spirit, and that Saul was a type of the soulish man. He was defeated. He had lost his relationship with God. God had released an a evil spirit that was sent by God to him because he was carnal. To please God, we have to walk and flow in the spirit. You are created in his likeness and in his image. We have to, in all things, flow and walk in the spirit, man. And we will not fulfill the lust and the desires of our sinful and evil nature. Amen. Just lift your hand. Just lift your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for new understanding and new revelation about the things that we're dealing with. We thank you for giving us an understanding to the root of the situation. We thank you for giving us an understanding why we're dealing with what we're dealing with and how we are going to overcome. 
we thank God for Jesus that he has made us victorious and he has died that we would be overcomers. And we just receive the blessings. We receive the promises. We receive the weapons that you have given us. Father, help us to understand that, that, that every battle that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood. And we're not going to be victorious by using flesh and blood methods. But we will overcome by using the Holy Spirit combined with our spirit man and utilizing the weapons that you gave us to be victorious. We give you thanks today, Father. And I just speak right now to everybody that's in the battle. I speak right now. I just speak grace and I speak mercy. I bind every spirit that is attacking God's people right now. And I break every assignment of the enemy right now. In the name of Jesus, I cast down every imagination and every high thing that would try to exalt itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I declare that every mind is coming into subjection to God's word. I declare that every heart is being pricked with the, with the word of God. And that right now the word is standing strong in every believer that is under the sound of my voice. Come on, even those of you that are listening to our broadcast, just lift your hands right now. God is right now breaking every bond of the enemy. I bind every spirit. I know, Father, that you say what I bind on earth is going to be bound from your throne in heaven and and what I loose on the earth is going to be loosed from your throne in heaven. And that you're going to do these things. So right now, I bind the devil and I loose the believer. I bind the devil and I loose the believer. And I declare that no weapon that is formed against God's people is going to prosper. I cast down everything that is exalting itself against Jesus Christ and against his people. And I declare that even now we are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony, even as we put on the whole armor, the whole armor of God right now, as we put on the whole armor, the full armor, and we walk in it and we keep our faith right now in he who saved us in the name of Jesus. And I declare right now, uh, God, that's it, just receive it. That's it, there's a release going forth right now. Just receive it where you are. Just receive it. There's a breakthrough that's happening right now by the anointing of the Most High. By the anointing of the Most High, I break every word curse. I bind all witchcraft. I bind every generational curse right now in the name of Jesus. And I cast down every spirit that is trying to exalt itself above Jesus Christ in the, in the lives of the believers that are listening to me right now. <sighs> Come on, just receive it. There's breakthrough happening right now. There's breakthrough happening right now. There's breakthrough happening in your minds right now. Minds are being set free. I seek the peace of God that passes all understanding right now into every mind and into every heart. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I find every tormenting spirit. I find every spirit that is assigned to, to any person under the sound of my voice is emotion. I speak peace be still. I say peace be still to every believer's emotion right now in the name of Jesus. And I declare that faith is arising. I declare that love is arising. I declare that joy is arising. I declare that peace is arising. And I declare that all the fruit of the Spirit is arising in every believer's life right now. In the name of Jesus. And I cast down every spirit that is not of God. Every spirit that is not of God. I cast it down. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of He who was and is to come. Our soon to return King Jesus Christ. And all God's people said amen. And amen. Thank you.